Uh, today what we're going to be doing is looking at Psalm 27. And while we look at Psalm 27, we're going to be blessed because we're going to find this out is that the writer of this psalm is David and he speaks to us and even though at the time he wrote this, he might not even realize that people in today's uh, land and culture around the world could be encouraged by this text. When we read Psalm 27, I want you to focus in on the King of Glory. The King of Glory is who is, of course, Jesus Christ. But there's also going to be a theme in this is of how to face our fears. I'm not talking about fears of the ghost under your bed or someone in your closet, you know, that we would have as a child, those kind of fears. But I'm talking about fears in which we have genuinely to move when God calls us to act, but we're afraid to do so. We have so much potential right here in the four walls of this sanctuary that God is using you and can use you. But sometimes what happens, as I've noticed, is that we can be so afraid that we will fail God that we will not act. Let me say this to you. Failure to act is failing God. You, you'll get that, I promise. When you fail to act then God is not blessed by it. Let's look today at our scripture. This is a psalm of David out of the 150 psalms that you find in the Old Testament hymn book. David is one of the uh, prominent writers. And David writes this and he says in Psalm 27, our foundation will be all 14 verses. He says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my stronghold in my life. Whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers came against me to devour my flesh, my foes and my enemies stumbled and fell. Though an army deploys against me, my heart is not afraid. Though a war breaks out against me, still I am confident. I have asked one thing from the Lord, and it is what I desire to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, glazing on the beauty of the Lord and seeking Him in His temple. For we, for He will conceal me in His shelter in the day of adversity. He will hide me under the cover of His tent. He will set me high on a rock. And then my head will be high above my enemies around me and I will offer sacrifices to his tent. And with shouts of joy, I will sing and make music to the Lord. Lord, hear my voice when I call. Be gracious to me and answer me. My heart says this about you. You are to seek my face, Lord. I will seek your face. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not leave me or abandon me, God of my salvation. Even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord cares for me. Because all my adversaries show me your way, Lord, and lead me on a level path. Do not give me over to the will of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, breathing violence. I am certain that I will see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and courageous. And again I say, wait for the Lord. Amen. When David says, The Lord is my light and my salvation, it goes hand in hand. The Lord is these things. And it wasn't that David wrote this in the past tense. He is saying that the Lord at that very time in his life was exactly that. He is his light and his salvation. It goes hand in hand, meaning that if you have salvation, you will be walking in the light. And because you are in the light, it proves to everyone that you are saved. 
You see, when we are in darkness, what that is saying to the world is that we are living in uncertainty and fear and in sin. Far too often we have people who claim to be Christians, but whenever the light comes on, almost like cockroaches in a kitchen, when the light might come on, they spread and you don't see them anymore. Now you're looking at me like I'm crazy saying, what do you mean cockroaches in a kitchen when the light comes on? Trust me, some of you have been that poor before. That when you see that happening, sometimes we are at like that. We see that when the light of Christ shines, people do not want to be in it. But I'll let you know this, is that God sees us even when we're in our darkest state of sin. God still sees us. Here he says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. And then the question is that he already knows the answer. He says, whom shall I be afraid of? And so I ask you that today. Who should you be afraid of? Fear is a real thing. We know that. In fact, we live in a world that makes a profit off of fear, do we not? You think about all the companies that profit off of fear. When reading the scripture and doing work for my sermon preparation, just thinking about what companies, when you think about calling you up on your phone, these telemarketers wanting to sell you some kind of device or asking you what kind of security system you have or any of those kind of things. Why do we lock our doors at night? You say, well, just to keep our family safe. Well, because there's a sense that something bad could happen. But there was a time that people would actually leave their door unlocked or leave the house and the door open. I mean, it was just that type of society we lived in. I'd hear some of the older folks from when I was a little child that would say they remember when they were a kid not having air conditioner and they had a screen in porch and sometimes they would go out and sleep on the porch because they could feel the cool breeze come across. And you might say, well, won't you afraid? And they say, afraid of what? But today we wouldn't even dream of doing that. But I'll let you know that even though companies can make a profit off of fear, also you think about the government can play off of our fears. We're afraid and that news will pump ideas of why you should be afraid. All the things that you should be afraid of, I'm surprised you even got out of bed today. Or maybe because you got out of bed, you're afraid your bed had bed bugs. You see, there's so many things to be afraid of, right? How about science? In the last several years, science has played on our fears. It's played on, preyed on our fears that not even to leave our house or interact with people that during the time of COVID, and I'll say this, that people died in nursing homes without their family and friends around them because we were afraid that we would get them sick and that they would die by our visiting. What a sad event. And so we know that what we do is we see that science has played off on it. How about politicians? Elect this certain person and they will help you in your fears. You know, it's sad that we live in a political world now in which people try to get elected based on your fears. If you don't elect candidate A, then war will break out. If you elect candidate B, war won't break out. Let me say this to you. God is in control regardless of who you elect. And so regardless if it's government, science, politics, or any kind of company trying to profit off of fear, fear is a real thing. But Christ tells us that even when we are facing this, that we can face Him. You see, that's the opportunity today. You can go and embrace that four-letter word of fear. Or you can embrace faith. If you run to fear, I promise you, fear will fill you up. But if you run to the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, He also offers not only to fill you up with His love and peace, but to give it to you overflowing. The scripture tells us plainly, even in the Old Testament, and then I will show you an example of this in the New Testament. If you turn your Bible over quickly to Isaiah chapter 41, you find out in Isaiah chapter 41 a very 
short passage of Scripture when it talks about this type of fear. And the amazing thing in this, whenever it says in Isaiah 41.10, a very important mark your Bible verse, the prophet tells us, do not fear for the Lord is with you. He says, for I am with you. This is God speaking to His people. You know, it makes a difference who's with you if you're afraid. At night, now that Lincoln has got his own big boy bed and in the next room, he can still wake up in the middle of the night and he'll cry out for either mama or daddy. Any of you have ever had children that they're in the next room and they wake up kind of afraid because no one was in there and they call out for you? Have you ever done that? Maybe you called out for your spouse, where are you? And they're in the next room. Because <laughs> you were on the couch. The point is, see, no, no man's looking around right now. That's all right. The point is, is that when they wake up and a child calls out for mama or daddy, the reason why they do that is because they are afraid and they realize what can eliminate that fear. Having the one they know that loves them and protect them in their presence. Can I give you a powerful political statement that is not? It is not political. This is a passionate spiritual statement. Stop trusting in man to take away your fears. Trust in the Savior to do so. Here it says that I will not fear, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. If God is your God, you do not have to call out on man. If God is God, then you call out on Him, for we are then His children. And the verse continues, not only is He with you, but it says, I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will hold you up in my righteous right hand. Notice what the Father of glory says to His children. You don't have to fear because I offer you this faith. I offer you myself. And He says, I will strengthen you. Why? Because if we are weak, then that means we need to be strengthened. You do not strengthen something that's already strong. Make sense? And so by the writer saying that God will strengthen us, he says, I know you're my children, but because you're my children, I know also you're in a world that makes you weak. Fear can weaken us. Fear can weaken us spiritually. Fear can weaken us also physically. Living in fear. You know, there's conditions, isn't there? Living in fear. Fear of every little thing. The fear of spiders. The fear of the dark. The fear of paying your bills. Maybe you can get a doctor's note on that and then send that to uh, Duke Energy the next time you get something. Say, I have, a doc I have a medical condition. I have a fear of paying this bill. And then they might say, well, we'll just take away your service so you don't have to worry about paying it anymore. So the idea here is that we live in a world that the Lord knows that we're going to be living in some type of fear. Maybe fear of going on a mission trip. I will tell you that every mission trip I went on, my grandmother, God bless her, would always try to talk me out of it because she was so afraid that what was going to happen. Even when I went to Israel, she was like, oh, don't you know what's going to happen over in Israel? Oh, when I went to Africa, oh, what's going to happen to those headhunters? You know, they're going to have you in a pot of soup. Uh, you know, all of these kind of things. Trust me, they're not going to have me in a pot of soup. And the thing was, she was always afraid of me going, and I told her, I said, Grandma, don't you realize I could step out here right now, get in the car, and, and get hit and die just as easy as I could be overseas? She said, yeah, but that's overseas. She just couldn't get it. Any of you have mamas and daddies like that? Are any of you like that with your kids? All right, we're all honest here. The point is is that we live in that state, but if you're too afraid to take a step of faith to do what the Lord's called you to do, then what will get accomplished? I'm too afraid to read this scripture out loud. Can I tell you something? That if God leads you to do a scripture reading, read it even if you mispronounce every name in it. 
I tell you, the most humbling thing is to see someone that, and, uh, that was a very, not really great reader, but um, I can remember this old timey preacher, he got up and uh, didn't, I can't even remember the guy's name, but I can remember he did a revival when we were attending church in Wallace, and this guy, when he read the scripture, uh, he had like a speech impediment and couldn't hardly pronounce every single, you know, words we thought were basic. But I can remember that revival more than I can remember any of the others. I was probably about seven or eight years old. And it wasn't because of his speech impediment. I remember I remember his passion. And when he read that scripture, it was as if that scripture was true to him. And then I've heard some very eloquent speakers that had more doctor's degrees than you can ever imagine. And they read the scripture and that scripture was like a block of ice to them. It didn't move them. My friends... If God is moving you, don't be afraid to reach out, to step out, and serve Him. Sometimes we are not able to do certain projects, church, because we're afraid to give to that project, because what if we need something? Do you not know God loves you, and God's not going to lead you to give if He sees that you're going to be without? And even if you are without, maybe it's God teaching you to still trust in Him more. There's so many people that this church has helped with light bills and water bills and help with groceries that and gas that we don't advertise and we shouldn't have to advertise it. But the point is, is that God loves us and God wants us to be faithful. But when you're so afraid to do something, then what happens? Every year we ask people to serve on different committees and different things at church and one of the common responses, I just don't feel led, but then if you really get to the root of it and talk to them, you find out when you become their friend, they were afraid to do it. What if everyone's afraid to do it? Take a leap of faith in Christ. And here it tells us that He will give us strength to do it. He will help us. He will do these things because we're holding on to His righteous right hand. Now turn over now to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 20. See what it says also in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 20 verse 1. It says, when you go out to war against your enemies and you see the horses and the chariots and the army larger than yourself, do not be afraid of them for the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt is with you. So regardless of what you see with the natural eye, God is there, and God is greater than our enemies. Now turn over to Deuteronomy 31, verse 8. Deuteronomy 31, 8 8 says, The Lord is the one who will go before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you, nor will He forsake you. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Many of us need to hear that on a regular basis. And now let's turn over to the New Testament, Mark's Gospel chapter 4. So if you'll turn over to Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, let's see exactly an example of this while we still are here. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, what you're going to find is an account starting with verse 38 through 41 that shows the humanity of those who followed Jesus. And when I say that shows their humanity, it's because even though they followed Jesus, they loved the Lord, They still had human traits because they were just as human as you and I. Let me just give you a summary of what's happening here. Jesus and those apostles, disciples, get on the boat. And these are trained uh, fishermen. You have a tax collector on there as well. And this account's written about more than one area. It's recorded in several of the Gospels. And when they get on the boat, Jesus had been preaching and teaching. And when he gets on there, he's tired. And because he's tired, he goes to a different level of that boat and he lays, the Bible says, his head down on a pillow and goes to sleep. And while Jesus is asleep in this boat, any of you that have been in Sunday school probably have heard this story before, something happens. A storm comes up, and it's such a violent storm that even those who are natural 
men that were fishermen and, and knew what the waters were like, they were terrified and had much fear. They panicked. And I imagine if they were panicking that Matthew, who was a tax collector, I can only imagine his panic. And so they're panicking... And then they are concerned because of the one who they knew performed miracles is asleep. And if he's asleep and there's water coming in the boat and the boat is almost tearing apart, what will we do? Well, let's look at the text very quickly. It says that in verse 38, excuse me, verse 35, on that day when the evening had come, he told them, let's cross over to the other side. This is Jesus. So we know it is getting nighttime. So not only is there a storm up during the day, it would be bad enough, but now at night there's a storm. And it says, let us cross over. So they left the crowd. They took him along since he was already in the boat and the other boats were with him. A fierce storm arose and the waves were breaking over the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern doing what? Well, Jesus was over in the corner praying. Was he? No, was, he was asleep. Let me say this to you. When you're doing the Lord's work, te even teaching or preaching, uh, it can wear you out. And it says that he was tired, his natural, his humanity side was tired, and so he goes to sleep, and it says that while he is there, they're asleep, head on a cushion, so they, they woke, it says, so they woke him up and said to him, now this is almost an insult to the Lord, but they, they had such a relationship they could be honest with him. I love this part. Teacher! Rabbi, don't you care that we're going to die? That wasn't his plan, was it? It says, don't you care that we're going to die? Jesus got up, he rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, what? Peace be still. Yeah, peace be still. And the wind immediately, after negotiating with the Lord, no, that's not what it says. It says immediately the storm, the winds, the wave, it did what? It stopped. It died. And so it says the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And then he said to them, after he spoke to the storm, he spoke to the cowards. Because that's what they were. They were afraid. Fear had drew, had driven them away from Jesus and fear had driven them closer to what the world was doing. And notice what he does. It says, he spoke to them and said, why are you fearful? Do you still have no faith or little faith? And they were terrified and they asked one another, who then is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. Let's just spend a few moments here. Were they wrong for being afraid? No. Humanity was coming out. They were scared. About a week ago, I was traveling. I told us on Wednesday night, I was traveling to Chapel Hill. That was probably my first uh, problem in itself, but I was traveling to Chapel Hill about a week ago, and something popped off a car, two car lengths ahead of me, and on my truck, I could not have a decision to make. It was rolling down the interstate, and I had a, an odd option. I could go to the left and hit that cement wall that's there. I could go to the right and would collide with another vehicle. Or I could just brace for impact. And that's what I did. I braced for impact. And this object, this large object come bouncing down, looked like a rim or a tire come bouncing and hit the truck and smashed right into the truck and, and went off to the side. And at the time, yes, was I afraid? I was very afraid because I didn't know what was going to happen. I, had to, I had, didn't have time to react except for just grab the wheel and hold on and what was going to happen would happen. And when it was over with, stopped the truck, got out, looked, and realized the damage that was done, that can be fixed, but was very thankful that it didn't cause any damage to those inside the vehicle. Or yourself. Well, I was inside the vehicle, yes. <laughs> Yeah, 
And so that's the thing. Have you been through that? All of us have, right? But you see, fear is real. But once we can focus on the Lord, then it puts everything in perspective. You see, I want to let you know is that whenever they woke Jesus up, Jesus already knew what was going to happen. See, there was three S's in the, involved in that story. A storm, right? A Savior, and then silence. And the storm was what? Anything in your life right now can cause inside eternally you to be in a fearful storm. I was joking earlier about bills, but you know what? There, it can be a real thing to be afraid when you start getting more. And how many of you, when you go to the grocery store, you realize, wait a minute, I didn't put, that's not filet mignon, that's bologna. And it costs what filet mignon used to cost, right? How many of you know that bills can make you afraid? How am I going to feed my family? How will I do X, Y, and Z? And then the next we think about our health. Any of you been to the doctor and you get a report that something is just more elevated than it should? It can make us afraid, and not only for ourselves, but our spouse or our children, or if you have an aging parent, we can be afraid of what happens health-wise. We can be afraid of what's happening in this world. You watch the news at any time, they want you to be afraid. But we also need to understand, although fear is real and all of these things are real, that there is one who is greater than our fears. Amen. And he is not asleep. The one who is greater than all our fears sits on the throne of glory there in heaven waiting for his father to tell him to come get his bride. His name is Jesus and He is greater than those fears. And when we are afraid, at least we can do like those disciples in the boat. We can run to the Lord and say, we have true fears. When David wrote that psalm, he wrote about the one who would take away the fear and replace it with faith. Today, what do you have more of? It's easy, isn't it, to have more fear than it is faith? But how many of you can write down and think about, as Tanya comes up, how many of you could really think about all the things in your past that you were afraid of? All the things you were afraid of, and now you look back years later and you realize, well, the Lord got me through that. Can anyone testify? I'm not asking for a verbal testimony, but can you at least nod your head that there was something that was going on? and you were afraid, you were concerned, it was legitimate, and now you look back and say, but Lord, he was, the Lord was there right all along, wasn't he? Amen. Yes. I want to encourage you before we leave here this. Whatever is causing you to be afraid to serve the Lord, maybe you're afraid someone will make fun of you because you are wanting to serve him and you say, well, I can't serve the Lord because, I, I, as I said earlier, maybe my, my reading, my speech is not like it ought to be. Well, you know what? Moses tried to pull that one too. And the Lord said, well, Moses, I've got your brother Aaron. But there was a reason he didn't use call Aaron in the, in the first place because Aaron was a people pleaser instead of a God pleaser. That's how that golden uh, calf came about. But God pulled Aaron along right with Moses. Maybe you're saying, I can't serve the Lord because I'm too young. I'm afraid of my youth and inexperience. I don't forget there was a young man named Timothy that was told by Paul, don't let him look down on your youth. <coughs> Maybe you say, I can't serve the Lord because, and you fill in the blank. It's interesting through Genesis to Revelation that there's so many accounts. One person I heard say there was 365 fear knots in the Bible. Well, that's not true. There's actually more like over 500 fear knots in the Bible. But think about what right now is causing you to be afraid to take a commitment for Jesus. I close with this. If Tanya, you want to just play just something very soft, I, I want to tell you tell this 
because I think that it will speak to you. There is an article that I read on a Christian persecution website and it gives updates on those who are persecuted because of their faith. In a recent article just this week that I read in one of the African countries, a woman who was in the Muslim religion, married to a Muslim, her husband had left for two weeks to go on some type of trip. At that time, she had been invited to a Bible study held by a Christian family in that community. The woman went because it was a friend who invited her. Something amazing happened at that event. She got to know Jesus. This Muslim woman was excited about getting to know who Jesus Christ is. She accepted Him as her Lord and her Savior and she rejected the teachings of her Muslim faith that she had. When her husband arrived back home and discovered her Bible and discovered that she had accepted Jesus, you would probably think the husband would be excited because her eyes were open to the newfound faith that has offered her eternal life. But instead, he beat her, he drug her out of the house, stripped her naked, wrapped her in a blanket, poured gasoline on the blanket. And last week when he wrapped her in that blanket and poured gasoline on it, if you were to ask her, was she afraid? The answer would have been yes. But she did not recant her faith in Jesus. You see, her faith, even though she had fear of what was about to happen, she was still faithful. He poured the gasoline on that blanket that his wife was wrapped up in. He takes a match. He lights it and throws it on the blanket. The blanket's fire consumed the woman and her flesh started to melt off her body. Thankfully, there were other believers in there that saw this at the time, restrained him and were able to put out the flames and get her to help. She was taken to a hospital. She did not give in to those burns. Although her body flesh was burned and will probably take some time to ever recover, if ever will recover fully. And the thing is, when I read that story, I thought to myself, if that were us, would the fear, when the moment that we got stripped naked, would be we be afraid and said, no, I don't believe in Jesus anymore. Would we give up on Jesus the moment we were drug out of the house? Would we give up on Jesus the moment we were wrapped up in that blanket? No, I don't believe in Jesus anymore. Would we have given up on Jesus the moment the gasoline was poured on us? And, the, and you know the smell of gas, right? Would we have said, I don't believe anymore. It's a lie. I don't know Jesus. Would we have given up on Jesus the moment the match was lit? Because how many of you know it's not very smart to have fire and gas near each other? Amen. Would we have said, I don't know the Lord the moment the flame left the hand of the husband? That woman didn't. And I will tell you this. Great was her faithfulness. Because I believe that somehow, someway, in the two weeks that they were teaching her about Jesus, that somehow, someway, they must have told her about one name, Jesus, the Son of God, who was stripped naked, who was drug out, who was beaten, battered, and bruised, who was a bloody condition, who was put on a cross, who died for our sins, but even though he died, he rose again. Could it have been that that woman in that little African village somehow in her heart believed, even if I die, I know the one who saved me has a home prepared for me. Oh, did it hurt them flames? Absolutely. But the thing was, she remained faithful. I believe one day when she takes her last breath, 
that she will definitely hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful. And what she was asked about her feelings about her husband and that church that did this, she said this, and I close with this. She said, will you pray that he will learn about the one I love named Jesus? We should pray for people like that, should we not? Not only the victim, but the one who did that. Friends, I don't know how many of us would be able to keep our testimony. You think of that, won't you? Would the fear have been so great that you'd forgot about your faith? Jesus, whatever decision you have for us right now, let us be willing to accept you as our Lord and Savior King. Let us, Lord, know the fear can be removed from our hearts. Let us, Lord, know that things are not going to get better on this side of eternity. I don't know why preachers are preaching those sugar-coated lollipop sermons that everything's going to get so much better because reading the Bible, persecution will come. Danger's going to come. And dear friends listening now to the sound of my voice, if you're not being troubled by the world right now, maybe it's because the world doesn't want to waste its time troubling one of its own. Will you be faithful to the Lord? even when you're afraid? Will you serve Him even when you're afraid? And when fear comes into your heart, will you at least say, Lord Jesus, will you fill me up and let me overflow in your faithfulness? And when He does that, my friends, it will change every single thing about the way you read your Bible, the way you attend church, the way you pray, It'll change everything about you if you just focus in on God's love and faithfulness instead of the fear of this world.